And I'm so happy, you know, that, that you suggested to start with, um, like the painful stuff right away. Right. Cause I was like, oh my gosh, like, how do I tiptoe around it? Do I have to create this like feather bed for her to, you know, to like comfort her and feel safe and everything. And you were just like, no, like, let's start with these <laughs> painful experiences. <laughs> Great. I'm German. Like that's what we do. We're very direct. Right. And yeah. yeah. I'm so glad that you suggested that. And I honestly just really want to like dive in because uh, I quickly want to tell the people how I came across your work because I had purchased like a course or whatever of a fellow uh, coach and mentor. And I saw you in one of her coaching calls, right? The content, right. Rebecca, amazing. And I don't know the way you like articulated yourself and the way you spoke also about vaginismus, which I've never, I think you're like the first person ever in my entire life that I had seen talking about this very sensitive topic in such like, um, just in such a, like a normal way, you were just, it, it was very like free the way you put your words. And I was just like, wow, like that's so fascinating. I've never experienced that you know and I, I I told you like I have a story that very much relates to it and I always felt very like alone and I was feeling like I'm doing this you know by myself it was such a shameful like path in a way also you know so it, it was very it felt very liberated and that absolutely fascinated me so yeah and then I really knew like I had to hit you up and really yeah dive into this and also like normalize this um yeah, just this like experience and then also the transformation that obviously came with it because you sitting in front of me right now as a, it seems like a very liberated woman and also the way you express on social media. And um, yeah, so can you take us back a little bit to that? Because it hasn't always been like that, right? It was a, there was a time in your life that was a little bit more challenging regarding yeah. the relationship of your, yeah, with your lower body. Absolutely. This is a conversation that lives in the dark nooks and crannies of the world, unfortunately. And I feel like it is our duty. Like we've just kind of been pulled into this part of life to be in expression around these otherwise really shameful pieces of life. Because we've all grown up in a shame steep culture around sex and pleasure. And also in the patriarchal sort of understanding of what it means to be a woman in the world. So here we go. Let's go back to the very first attempt at having PIV sex. And I like to say PIV, penis and vagina sex, because there's so many other forms of sex. But, you know, unfortunately, in our society, we kind of see this as the holy grail and as the only form of sex. But I was 18 years old at the time with my very first boyfriend. And I remember being in his room just outside of Toronto, being so turned on and aroused and feeling safe in his presence. You know, I loved him, trusted him. I wanted him inside me as this very first time that we could have this experience. And what I was met with was a brick wall where my vaginal opening was supposed to be, you know, parts of me even doubted that it existed because even before that, I wasn't able to wear tampons at all. I kept throwing them in the garbage. And it was in this moment when we both were trying to push him inside of me and there was no going in that I realized, all right, there's something more here. Aside from the tampon challenges, the tampon chronicles that I've had <laughs> by myself and all those toilets and all those bathrooms, right, to try to insert this thing. And now he wasn't going in either. And it was very confusing. It was frustrating. On some level, we also kind of thought to ourselves, well, you know, maybe this is supposed to happen. First time penetrative sex is supposed to be painful, as we're told in our society, which is a whole other thing, unfortunately, a self-fulfilling prophecy. But two or three attempts after that first one, when we were starting to insert a little bit of him inside and I was in excruciating amounts of pain, I realized there's more here. There, I'm going to have to go on some sort of journey. I had no idea what it was yet, but that was kind of the beginning. Wow. And then like you had that realization also, well, first of all, I want to like ask you how he dealt with it. Right. Because normally I, I also feel like there's kind of like a shame issue because you're kind of, 
you know, it's what it's, what is expected from you as a woman, you know, that you receive and that you receive easily and you just accept it and it's open and, you know, it's like wet and it's like, you know, so how can you take, take us back a little bit? Yeah. To that moment. Yeah, I can. And I have been incredibly lucky to have men in my life that have been so understanding and it sounds a little bit odd, but in, in many times, I was the one being more hard on myself than, than my partner was. And I think we have this association and notion that, you know, the man's not going to be satisfied or he's going to be upset. And I, that does happen. Unfortunately, women are in certain relationships like this. But I hope that my story is an example of the fact that there are so many partners out there that are willing to go through anything that it takes to you know, be in relationship with us, have us in their lives and, and be in our lives. And that particular example was a beautiful example like that is very understanding. And in fact, <laughs> our story included us telling his parents about what we're going through, because that was one access point to being able to get uh, sex therapy. And I went to two appointments of sex therapy. And it's a whole other story in itself because of the way that I personally wasn't ready for this kind of deep dive, but also the kinds of recommendations that I received. So that conversation was very open. And uh, even after that being in other long-term relationships, I was met with very supportive partners. Yeah. At the same time, you know, vaginismus was one big reason of why we ended our relationship. There are so many layers to it because of how we feel and how we identify as whether or not we're a good girlfriend. And I remember thinking to myself, well, he deserves better. This is the time of his life to be adventurous and to have all the sex that he wants. And like, I'm not able to provide that. And that led to additional cycles of pain and shame spirals uh, and backs and back and forth of like, oh, no, we should break up and let's not. And then he kind of maybe brings up the question and I say, let's not. And it was years later that we ended that relationship. But um, it started off in a beautiful way when well, it comes so, to it. Yeah. I'm so happy that you had like a very understanding like partner and how, like, what was your journey then? You had that moment where you realized that. And also, did you do it like by yourself? Did you do it together with him? Did you work with like, you know, dilators or like how, what was, what was the the journey? Yeah. So what first happened is I went to my family doctor at the time and I raised this concern, you know, I gathered up the courage too, because that in itself was a big step and a leap of faith for so many of us. And what's unfortunate is that oftentimes on the very first to reach out for help, we don't receive the help that we deserve. And all of a sudden we shut that entire conversation within ourselves and we don't look for help again. And kind of the road ends there. And that is a really terrible situation. In my case, the very first time I reached out, the recommendation that I received was, oh, well, your body just must not be ready for sex yet. Like you should just wait. That was it. The next component of this, I don't know if it happened at the same time or the second time I came back, but he told me, well, why don't you try to drink a glass of wine and relax? <laughs> and this is, it's funny, right? But that's what we hear as the very first thing. And it's like, wait a second, you think I haven't tried that? You think I haven't been blackout drunk in order to have penetrative sex? Many of us have that experience where we get high and we, we try to numb out, right? Because we just want to be able to do it. Mm. And those are the lengths that we go to. Um, so, you know, being disappointed by the recommendations that I was receiving, thankfully, I put my foot down. I got a requisition to go to a gynecologist that also didn't lead to any answers. Vaginismus was not mentioned there as well. Uh, a little bit of a pelvic exam was done, which seemed to go all right. But still, there was that sense of tightness and a whole lot more bracing and tightness when it actually came down to having penetrative sex. So next up, visiting a sex therapist was the very first time that my endless Google searches late at night, where I discovered the word vaginismus, was actually confirmed by this woman. And that gave me a sense of relief. 
oftentimes it's a relief and a heaviness at the same time that we experience when we get such a diagnosis because now it's like all right I know what it is but I also know what it is and (laughs) here we go we got to do the work for it and that was the first time that I was recommended to use dilators so dilators are this tool this set of tools like a tampon shape or a dildo shape more so like a tamp- tampon rather than a dildo unfortunately which in itself shows the shame seed culture we have around the shape of the penis and I was given a two-pager of instructions on how to use them mostly that went you know you got to use the first one maybe breathe and relax but definitely not enough of the emotional the erotic exploration that's necessary so I found myself laying in my bed many times over And trigger warning here, I'm about to use the R word, that I felt like I was raping myself because I was pushing through that pain, feeling like if this dilator just sits in me for long enough, then my muscles are going to be able to relax and allow for this to happen in a pain-free kind of way. That was a really deep experience that I, I know resonates with so many people. And it led to more than four or five occasions of feeling like I had completely given up. I put those dilators back where I felt like they belonged in the darkness of my closet to gather dust. (laughs) And I just kind of went on with my life to try to sweep vaginismus under the rug. And a lot of a lot of us do that because it's the only way that we can feel like we can manage through that emotional confusion. We just kind of get busy. And that in itself may actually be part of the cause for such an experience. Uh, And maybe we'll get into talking about those layers too. But what resonates and what feels like, you know, important or more memorable from, from what I shared so far. Yeah. It's so interesting um, because I told you, like, I've never shared this, like, on the air or, like, on the internet or, like, anywhere. This is the first time I'm ever, like, saying that out loud, right? That uh, I can so relate to this uh, story and also the dilator story and uh, the brick wall that you were talking about. Um, And it's just, you saw me, like, I'm tearing up a little bit because it's, I'm just so happy that, you know, for me, it almost feels like the dots are connecting a little bit. Like when you always feel like you're the only person who experiences that and you you don't dare to like talk about it. And people now, you know, they see me as someone that is very like, you know, sensual and sexually liberated, but that has been such a long journey, you know, and I know you can relate like, and there's so much work that goes into it. And like you, the dialogue that you have with your body, it's just such an intimate experience and at the same time it's like there's so much like shame you don't talk about it then there's pain and then it's like why is it not working you know with the the same like the tampon chronicles oh my god like you know (laughs) my entire like youth basically was that and I was I always felt like wrong you know the the girls they were like handing each other tampons and it just all looked so easy you know and I was like why is it not happening for me and then also you don't really Mm. because I didn't really know anything about like body awareness and like how to talk to my body and what it actually teaches us and what a great teacher it is you know and I also I wrote it down like when we had a brief conversation prior to this interview you also said like the body is on our team Team, it is communicating communicating in our favor by our boundary being set by it. I thought it was so beautiful, you know, and um, yeah. So for me, it's just such a relief to hear that, and I think it's it's very like healing for a lot of women that you share this experience and also talk about this like. Uh, you know, and then we want it inside of us. You And, you know, like you can feel that you want it, but it's just not going in and like the the whole frustration that is related to it. Right. So and then maybe you can talk a little bit about like this dialogue that you had with your body and how like the the intimate conversation maybe that that you started back then. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you so much for sharing and for doing the work that you do today that was born out of the pain that yeah. flourished into your purpose. It's beautiful. And we serve as permissionless for so many others 
in the world, you know, women and men to open up about th these conversations that we have, unfortunately, in private and or don't have at all. <laughs> um, and it's true that we really go to such great lengths to try to prove ourselves as well, like our worth as women and as our partners. It was a little bit later in my journey when I was in my second long term relationship that I remember holding my partner really close to me while he was inside me, but I was still gritting through pain at that time, holding him to me so that he doesn't see the pain written all over my face. Mm -hmm. So he doesn't see the tears starting to stream down my eyes. And that, that in itself shows like how much we want to please and prove ourselves. And of course we love our partners, but we, we don't honor our own experience uh, for the ability to do what we're supposed to do as girlfriends. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where the conversation with the body begins. Uh, in in a certain way, it's become it's begun a lot uh, sooner than that in unconscious ways. But when we start to bring the unconscious to the conscious mind, and we start to understand why she might be acting this way so much opens up into our awareness. And this is the very reason that I like to call vaginismus a protective body response, rather than what we refer to in our society as a sexual dysfunction, which relates to the identity that we take on to as dysfunctional because we have a sexual dysfunction. It's incredibly disempowering. So referring to vaginismus as really what it is of a protective body response is a whole mindset shift around it, which I feel really helps us in understanding vaginismus. Because just as we might get sand thrown at our eye, at our face by someone, right? We're gonna close our eyes as soon as we realize that this danger is approaching us. We consciously and subconsciously know that the sand coming towards our face is not a thing we, we want. <laughs> and in the experience of vaginismus, it's more so that the body subconsciously knows that it is perceiving this thing, this is dangerous, right? This is dangerous. It's a perceived danger to it. And therefore, what does it do? Oh, well, just like the eye, it shuts down. Nope, this isn't coming in. Like we're going to protect ourselves. This is our greatest responsibility. This is what we do. And we close. So our body says no for us. And a really pivotal moment in the dilating journey, for example, which by the way, is one of the last things we have to do. One of the last things we get to do as we introduce penetration as a safe and pleasurable thing. Before that, there's the emotional and erotic components. But a really big shift happens when we lay down to dilate, maybe 20 times over, we're in communication with our body and we actually hear our body saying, I don't feel safe right now, I don't wanna to dilate today. I don't want this. I don't desire this. And we actually honor that no. So 20 times over, we maybe have the intention to dilate, but we say, I'm not going to. Thank you, body. I'm listening to you. What might happen on that 21st time is that our vagina, she looks up at us from down there <laughs> and she sees, oh my goodness, Katrin is consistently saying no for me. I don't have to do that anymore. She's got us. She holds this responsibility. She's taking care of me. And that is the moment in which she actually finally starts to feel safe and lets go of all of this heaviness responsibility of like needing to close for us. And it's only with that safety that curiosity can then start to bubble up. That's how we have our sexual desire start to come back because mine was at a big fat zero at a really large portion of my life because I was dreading where I was going to lead, right? And it is that safety and curiosity then that makes space for, ooh, I wonder what would happen if I explore over here. Or like, oh, this has felt good before. Why don't we have that again? And we make our way into pleasure. So safety, curiosity, and pleasure. But only after we take back our no. Mm. And we have to continuously be in that beautiful relationship to listen to our vulva, our vagina, and hear her no. You got to communicate with her. That's yeah. kind of how it how it goes. And 
so how can we for for like women because for us I feel like you know also like my intuition is it's so strong and so powerful and I'm so connected to it and I can sense that with you too mm -hmm. but sometimes you know we have women that feel okay that they feel that no and they maybe like want to change something and they want to communicate more easily with their body like where do they like start like how can you dive a little bit more you know yeah with a little bit more awareness into this absolutely wonderful question because you're right that's a pretty big leap to make from like not being in that relationship to then all of a sudden we're going into the deep dive of like being really aware of those subtle sensations like that's a big jump so what often is really supportive and leading us there is starting to practice some of those skills of putting up boundaries having healthy experience of saying no in other areas of the world other areas of our lives Boundary setting starts outside of the bedroom. And I feel like I feel like part of my genius zone in the way that I connect the dots on things is helping me connect the dots too on like sex, love, relationships, and even entrepreneurship and business, right? There are so many areas of life in which I was never taught to say no. Nobody really ever taught us that. Have you ever been celebrated for saying no about something? Like I'm not available for that or I don't want to go to this party. No. And two, part of the way that we can become better parents, if that's something we desire, is when our child says no, like, I don't want to hug Uncle Johnny. I don't really feel like it, right? To actually celebrate them and let them know that their body is their own and they get to use it however they would like. Mm -hmm. So that in itself is a practice. Um, speaking up in certain ways in our workplaces, in our relationships, sharing difficult things, being a little bit more vulnerable in little steps. And I like to say that the change in our lives happens at the edge of our comfort zone. We don't have to like deep dive head first outside of our comfort zone for change to happen. I don't believe that's how it works. I think we've got to always have this tether and this connection to a state of safety in our nervous system in order to be living at that edge of the comfort zone where it feels like, oh, okay, there's some growth happening here. And then to just be able to take step by step outside of that to actually expand our comfort zone. And there is this experiment that was done, um, not even sure if it was an experiment, but the insight from it was that if you put a whole bunch of kids in the backyard of a school that has no fence in the backyard, what you're gonna find is they're gonna continuously play in like little chunks of groups close to the school. But as soon as you put a fence of like, okay, this is where the backyard ends, right? This is where the school yard is. You see kids playing in all corners, exploring all the space because they feel like they have a safe container in which they can explore and play. That is in itself a boundary. That's in itself kind of like what boundaries create for us. They create safety in whatever is allowed. Mm -hmm. And there are certain games that I invite my clients to play. Uh, we explore the wheel of consent, which is a concept created by Betty Martin to see how often we're actually the givers of pleasure in our relationship and how we haven't really practiced receiving fully in a way that we're receiving something just for us without having to please back. And there's other dynamics to explore there. So it's a journey, but it definitely starts outside of the bedroom. Mm. And I feel it's also like, it reminds me of, you know, a time where I was very much like, where I needed to control everything, you know, and where I, um, cause also like the, the women in my family, they are amazing. Like they get shit done, you know, but it's also because they are very much in their masculine energy and just do. And they are like, I want this. I know this, this is a yes, this is a no. Like they're very clear, very like there, they have this like lioness energy. And what I had to learn, and I'm so grateful for it uh, during the past year, during the past years was more this like vulnerability and just really like being able to receive not only in the bedroom, you know, it shared like it, it, it changed my 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 vaginism story like completely when I, you know, op opened myself up to receiving not only men, but in general to 
be like introduce this playfulness a little bit more into my life this curiosity and just like um yeah the magic and you know release this like need of needing to control everything you know yeah I love that you bring up the topic of control and receiving uh, what I have found is that we share a common theme in that, in the way that we have found safety and control. Mm-hmm. That was our survival strategy when we were younger. My family, I uh, was around the energy of chaos quite a bit because my parents fought a lot and they were doing their very best in their own, you know, chaotic time of their relationships. But I was in a state of feeling like I want to change that like I I want to but I can't and so I feel completely out of control over here in my life so what do we do well we find the space in which we are in control and in my case that was putting my head down in the books and being a really high achiever participating in the extracurriculars also the dynamic of being a good girl played so much in here because if I got the good grades and if I was good then my parents would celebrate me and then maybe they would stay together because you know there would be reason enough to keep the family together there's all of these ways that we mold and shape and shift ourselves in order to please and in order to feel like something is okay in our lives And oftentimes this way that we find control may also be with food and with eating. And so we have other experiences uh, that are very much associated to pleasure as well, imaginousness. But then what happens later when we grow older and then we want to have the most vulnerable experience we could possibly have as women, as vagina owners to like have another human being inside of us, right? Like, holy shit, that's, that's vulnerable stuff. When we then need to succeed at this thing and our our method for success so far has been control, we all of a sudden, again, come up against that brick wall and say and realize, well, life is asking me to find safety in surrender, mm-hmm. not in control, in surrender. And that is brand new territory. And what is asked of us on an even deeper level is finding safety in the unknown of life in that mystery because so far we found safety when we knew what our plan for the day was or like what we're doing next week or all of these elements that kind of had us grip onto some sort of known elements now it's like all right well another human being is going to be at their own discretion and at the whim of like being around you and being inside you yes you can communicate but it's still this deep level of trust that's required to open and to feel safe in the presence of another person and oftentimes in the presence of the masculine energy. Mm-hmm. And if, when we grew up, the masculine energy was a source of uh, kind of like uncertainty. You never really knew what you were going to get. They weren't your safe space. You had to walk on eggshells in their presence. Maybe they were controlling or had narcissistic tendencies or anger was a really big component that was scary, which then also created a suppression of anger within our own system because the monster there, like you don't want the monster in here too, right? So like you shut it down, shut it down and shut it off. But because of that fear subconsciously of the masculine, we too simply can't quite feel safe around the masculine presence. Mm-hmm. And that's a really big theme too. Mm. Yeah, it's very interesting. Like we also talked about crying during sex, right? And what I have experienced is that when I cried either during sex or after sex, it is very much related to, it's not only the release of like, you know, the tension, the sexual tension is also very often, like I'm so grateful because I can actually feel it's a puzzle piece of, you know, releasing trauma and as you said, like surrendering more and more to the unknown, trusting, it's a puzzle piece of, you know, in the journey of trusting the masculine. And yeah, as you said, like feeling safe in surrendering, you have written a really beautiful post uh, about this. And this was actually one, you know, one of the reasons why I approached you. And can you tell me a little bit about this? Because I know that you also like experience that or that you have that um, from time to time. Yeah, thank you. Um, Crying during and after sex 
again, is another thing we got to talk about more often. And like you said, sometimes that energy that was stored, whether in our musculature and our fascia, wherever you believe it is to be, often depends in our cervix as well. There's a lot of cervical healing that we can do as a society as women. Uh, but sometimes when it gets released, and for me, oftentimes it kind of starts to feel like there's tears welling up. Sometimes there's like a ball in my throat. There's something coming up from the lower chakras up into our throat chakra, our expression that just wants to finally have the space to be expressed. And I feel like that's exactly how we close the cycle on trauma that we hold in our bodies. Sometimes that energy can come out and it can be related to a story. Mm -hmm. A story, a fact in our life, like actual events, relationship dynamics, whatever that might be. And sometimes we have a really clear awareness of like, oh, I know, I know what I'm processing right now. Like this is me, for example, feeling so, uh, so controlled, like not able to have my own opinion and my expression or not being listened to, not being believed on some level or whatever else it could be, right? Like something specific. And sometimes that energy can, can bubble up to be released and you have absolutely no, no idea why you're crying, but you're crying. Or you feel this like rage and anger, but you don't know why. And I wanted to include this piece because I think it's important for us when we're in that experience, not to like judge and shame ourselves for it. And also not to be feeling like, I, why don't I know why I'm doing this? Oftentimes we don't need to know the reason why in order to process and heal and release. And may this serve as a permission slip, right? For anyone listening that this is an incredibly normal and experience to be celebrated and it doesn't need to be understood because there's so much mystery to how we function in this physical vessel that we're in, right? Whatever your belief system is, it may even be that there were other lives that we experienced that were processing in that deep openness and surrender uh, as souls living a human experience. Yeah. yeah. Also, I think like, I mean, as you said, like it, it, sometimes it relates to a specific story. Sometimes it's like you remember a certain, maybe also dynamic in your own family, you know, with like the the males in your family, that's like what I have, like there has never been, you know, physical abuse or anything, but like I always felt and sometimes still feel it's like I have, um, I I'm releasing, you know, the, the stories that I tell myself or like the shame or frustration that I had with like my dad or my grandfather or these like very powerful and also very dominating, um, you know, males, like in our families, you know, and we're basically breaking generational, generational cycles with that too, which is also very, very beautiful, you know? And yeah. And then also at the same time, this, like, uh, as I said, this like lioness, uh, energy that, you know, the women in my family always have, you know, I mean, they, they allow other people to cry, but they don't want, um, they don't don't want to be seen you know when they cry like they don't want to show their vulnerability too much and i feel like every time i allow myself to cry during sex after sex and allow myself you know that space it's also like healing for the entire uh, lineage you know so yeah it's really beautiful and it's it moves me and i <laughs> i almost feel like we're such like peace warriors you know that we do this work and um yeah, it just really breaks like generational cycles. Yeah. It really does. Those patterns of the alpha woman being the only woman that could exist, that could like really be at the forefront of what a woman is supposed to be like is exactly what we're called to shift and change, I believe, in, in our existence. Mm -hmm. uh, and we can also talk about the energy of the alpha versus the omega, right? There were so many reasons for which our moms and grandmothers may have felt like they cannot soften into the omega. They were in the survival mode themselves. And, you know, we have, I guess, this gift and opportunity to be able to, even in our own survival strategies through life, find safety and being able to have a balance of both. Mm -hmm. And what also happens so beautifully in relational dynamics is when we step out of our own alpha into the omega, 
maybe while we're holding space or supporting others, we're in our alpha or we're creating structure in our life. Sure. But when we're in our omega in our relationship, we also give the opportunity for the masculine to step up into their alpha. And the masculine in many ways have been suppressed by the alpha women of our lineage. And so you see that they were never called up to the responsibility that they had to hold as safe keepers, because guess what? They may have been oppressed by their own mothers. And in my life, and just even as I'm speaking right now, I'm accessing this additional puzzle piece of compassion and empathy and understanding for, say, my father, who was also in a situation like this. And hence, he never got the opportunity to learn from a healthy father figure. I should correct myself. He had the opportunity to learn from a healthy father figure. It wasn't his original father. There was abandonment wounds and such as well that were kind of at play. Uh, but the alpha mother figure can sometimes overpower even a healthy father figure from whom to learn. Uh, so that cycle is just continuously like we're ping ponging back and forth. And who really is the the victim? There is really never any victim, but. Um, we kind of have created that together in our generational lineage slowly but surely and now is the time that we get to change that and we almost have the responsibility to put out these fires that were started many years ago that finally we have the skill and the awareness to be able to uh, put out so they don't continue on in future generations Mm, I love this yes (laughs) Um, how does this like translate into business? I also wrote down something that you said, and it, it was the way we show up one way. Um, I don't remember like how exactly you said it, but you remember what, what I mean, right? Like the way we show up in one area of our lives, you know, it kind of translates into um, to other areas and like the bedroom, you know, and um, the business, it kind of like relates. So Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, I really like even bringing in this concept that everything is fractal, which means when we zoom into something, we see the same pattern. And then when we zoom out of it, we see the same pattern, kind of like atoms and electrons circling the atom. It's the very same thing with like moon circling the planet, right? So we zoom out and we zoom in. It's kind of the same. Mm -hmm. And in our lives, the way that we show up in one area of life Uh, also gives us a lot of insight on how we show up in every other component of life as well. So when we make certain growth steps in, let's say, the way that we set boundaries with our family, that's going to translate very directly in exactly how we might set boundaries in the bedroom, how we might speak up in the bedroom. Uh, how we create a structure in how we lead someone through a journey, like one of a a client, right, that we're supporting, is also giving us weight and being able to create a similar structure for ourselves in a friendship that feels a little bit sticky, for example. Uh, So every single opportunity in life is an opportunity for growth, which means you can find that access point in the bedroom and then bring it out into all other areas or maybe the access point to start with is in a friendship and then you start to bring that all in all other areas that's why when we you know work with overcoming vaginismus with deactivating this protective body response we kind of try to take the path of least resistance like what feels like the access point right now when it comes to speaking your desires Could you maybe speak your desires with what you desire to have for dinner tonight (laughs) Mm -hmm. as an access point? And then that desire, therefore, can start to be concrete in your mind of like, oh, I got that. And it was okay for me to ask for that. Well, what else is it okay for me to ask for? What if I get to ask for some more time off, like in my workspace? Cool. Okay. Well, how about I ask for like some G G area stimulation in the bedroom so that I can maybe explore G spot orgasms. Like that's how how it builds up. Mm -hmm. And how does it translate? Like, uh, you know, in your personal journey, what have you experienced 
you know, because you also talked about more openness and just like surrendering to the unknown and your whole like vaginismo story. And it, it's such a, it was such a huge process. It sounds to me, you know, from like this brick wall, seeing you now on social media as this like very expressed woman, you know, successful in business. Um, yeah. What would you say were like the key, maybe you have like a, a few like key points or that you can share like um, in terms of opening that have, you know, translated into your business, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Here are some examples. I feel like having more openness uh, at the stage of my vaginismus journey where I was already having pain-free penetrative sex, but I still hadn't accessed a lot of the sexual confidence, like the adventuring of it, additional layers of surrender. It was still at that point stage of my life that I decided to resign from my corporate life. I had become a CPA, an accountant, working in public accounting in Toronto, and it was the day before my 25th birthday, I guess you can say a bit of a quarter life crisis or liberation, <laughs> where I decided, you know, this is my time and I know that this has served me really well and I know there's just more that I'm supposed to do. So even with that layer of openness, I opened the door to being able to take such a big leap, such a step, to let go of what I had already known, what I worked so hard for, all of the additional layers of what my family is going to think, you know, if this is the right decision, and actually take a step into the unknown in this realm of life. It was because we take that one step that then the next step can start to become visible in time, right? We can only know when we take that next step. So it was about a year later that I came across a story, uh, someone's vaginismus story, probably on a blog or something. And I had seen all this information again, which had me remember all of these other aspects that were flooding back from my own journey that I tried to sweep under the rug because we try to forget the painful parts, right? And then I knew in my soul that I've got to put my story out there and create resources and a sense of community. So then you take that leap of faith and maybe you connect your, your name and your face to the story that originally I remember just sharing motivational quotes online, right? <laughs> um, after that, perhaps it's leaving a relationship that, that looks great on the outside, but isn't nourishing to your soul. And that was also part of my experience. In fact, I was engaged. I was engaged and I never would have thought that I would be that woman that breaks off an engagement. But I did, and we did together through a lot of difficult conversations. And that also felt like, wow, I'm stepping into the unknown again. And at a stage in life where my business had not been at the level it is today, meaning I was kind of going to be like, you know, a little bit on my own also financially because my partner at the time supported me so well. Uh, and now I'm dipping into more of my savings, for example, right? Again, more of the unknown. And a lot of our relationship to money gets to come up to the surface because money as well as a as an energy has so much to do with pleasure and how deserving we feel of good things. And maybe the last example that kind of comes to mind is that three and a half months ago, my partner and I sold all of our belongings 90% of our belongings, and we went to Brazil, and we have lived here for the last while. And that also is like, okay, where does this pull for freedom take us to? And how is it that we can be the creators of our life, a life by our design, rather than living a life by default, mm -hmm. that we're told should live in order to be successful and for our parents to be proud of us, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So it snowballs and there's so much beauty if we just release the reins a little bit and we start to trust that we are taken care of. Mm 